Chapter eighty eight of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter eighty eight. Charlotte Coday. Born seventeen sixty eight. Died seventeen ninety three amid which dim fervent of kine and the world history specially notices one thing in the lobby of the mansion de l'intendance where busy deputies are coming and going a young lady with an aged valet taking grave graceful leave of deputy barbaroux she is of stately norman figure in her twenty-fifth year of beautiful still countenance her name is charlotte coday heretofore styled Dormans, while nobility still was. Barbaroux has given her a note to Deputy de Paris, him who once drew his sword in the effervescence. Apparently she will to Paris on some errand. Quote, she was a republican before the revolution, and never wanted energy. End quote. A completeness, a decision is in this fair figure, quote, by energy she means the spirit that will prompt one to sacrifice himself for his country. End quote. What if she, this fair young Charlotte, had emerged from her secluded stillness suddenly, like a star, to gleam for a moment, and in a moment to be extinguished, to be held in memory, so bright complete was she, through long centuries, quitting Cimmerian correlations without, and the dim simmering twenty-five millions within, history will look fixedly at this one fair apparition of a charlotte coday will note where the charlotte moves how the little life burns forth so radiant then vanishes swallowed of the night with barbaroux's note of introduction and slight stock of luggage we see charlotte on tuesday the ninth of july seated in the kind diligence with a place for paris none takes farewell of her wishes her good journey her father will find a line left, signifying that she is gone to England, that he must pardon her and forget her. The drowsy diligence lumbers along, amid drowsy talk of politics and praise of the mountain, in which she mingles not. All night, all day, and again all night. On Thursday, not long before noon, we are at the bridge of Neuilly. Here is Paris, with her thousand black domes the goal and purpose of thy journey. Arrived at the Inn de la Providence, in the Rue de Vieux Augustines, Charlotte demands a room, hastens to bed, sleeps all afternoon and night, till the morrow morning. On the morrow morning she delivers her note to Duperet. It relates to certain family papers, which are in the minister of the interior's hand, which a nun at Caen, an old convent friend of Charlotte's, has need of, which Duperet shall assist her in getting. This, then, was Charlotte's errand to Paris? She has finished this in the course of Friday, yet says nothing of returning. She has seen and silently investigated several things. The convention, in bodily reality, she has seen what a mountain is like. The living physiognomy of Marat she could not see. He is sick at present, and confined to home. About eight o'clock on the Saturday morning she purchases a large sheath knife in the Palais Royal. Then straight away, in the place de Victoria, takes a hackney coach. To the Rue de la Collège de Médecine, number 44. It is the residence of the Citoyen Marat. The Citoyen Marat is ill and cannot be seen, which seems to disappoint her much. Her business is with Marat, then. Hapless, beautiful Charlotte hapless squalid marat from caen in the utmost west from neuchatel in the utmost east they too are drawing nigh each other they too have very strangely business together charlotte returning to her inn dispatches a short note to marat signifying that she is from caen that she desires earnestly to see him and quote, will put it in his power to do france a great service end quote no answer charlotte writes another note still more pressing sets out with it by coach about seven in the evening herself 
It is yellow July evening, we say, the thirteenth of the month. Marat sits, about half past seven of the clock, stewing in slipper bath, sore, afflicted, ill of revolution fever, or what other malady this history had rather not name. Excessively sick and worn, poor man, with precisely eleven pence half penny in paper, with slipper bath, strong three footed stool for writing on the while, and a squalid washerwoman, one may call her, that is his civic establishment in Medical School Street. Thither and not elsewhere has his road led him. Not to the reign of brotherhood and perfect felicity, yet surely on the way towards that. Hark! A rap again! A musical woman's voice refusing to be rejected. It is the citoyenne who would do France a service. Marat, recognizing from within, cries, Admit her. Charlotte Cadet is admitted. Quote, Citoyen Marat, I am from Caen, the seat of rebellion, and wish to speak with you. Be seated, mon enfant. Now what are the traitors doing at Caen? What deputies are at Caen? Charlotte names some deputies. Their heads shall fall within a fortnight. Croaks the eager people's friend, clutching his tablets to write. Barbaro, petit jean, writes he, with bare shrunk arm, turning aside in the bath. Petitjean and Louvet, and Charlotte has drawn her knife from the sheath, plunges it, with one sure stroke, into the writer's heart. Ah, moi, cher ami, help there! No more could death-choked say or shriek. The helpful washerwoman running in, there is no friend of the people or friend of the washerwoman left, but his life with a groan gushes out, indignant, to the shades below. On Wednesday evening, about half-past seven o'clock, from the gate of the concierge, to a city all on tiptoe, the fatal cart issues. Seated on it a fairly young creature, sheathed in red smock of murderess. So beautiful, serene, so full of life, journeying towards death, alone amid the world. The executioners proceed to bind her feet. She resists, thinking it meant as an insult. On a word of explanation, she submits with cheerful apology. As the last act, all being now ready, they take the neckerchief from her neck. A blush of maidenly shame overspreads that fair face and neck. The cheeks were still tinged with it when the executioner lifted the severed head to show it to the people. It is most true, says Forster, that he struck the cheek insultingly, for I saw it with my eyes. End of chapter 88 Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway The 3rd of November, 2012